Okay. Not that you guys need it. You don't need it. But it's for them. If we could, because the crowd is so disparate, why don't we all sort of get together here? So it's just like school where people are sitting in the back. I guess, Josh, you're okay because you're writing something. But if folks could make it easier to do it. And I appreciate you guys coming. I feel like a, a stand-up who has like their multiple waters waiting for them to do their thing. All right. So for those of you I haven't met, my name is Diego Bernal. I'm the state representative for Texas House District 123. Over here is a map of that district, and the push pins are all the schools. But just to give you an idea of the size of the district, just south of the airport and the colonnade, all the way through the center city, all of downtown, this area, and this line right here is Highway 90. So right on the other side of that would be Burbank. So because San Antonio people love to ask where people went to high school, and we use those schools to identify the part of town we're from, the northernmost high school is Churchill, and the southernmost high schools are Lanier, Brackenridge, and Fox Tech. So let's talk about what this is and why we did it and how we did it. Let me get that out of the way. Uh, I am a public ed nerd. I litigated school finance before I was on city council. Um, but I'm going to tell you a quick story, which you're going to hear a lot of in the future, which is my experience with AP English. And this is what got me thinking about this issue. I went to Jefferson High School. I turned 40 in October, so I'm class of 95. Um, in 1994, I was in, I think it was GT English. And my teacher, Anita Arnold, came to the class and said, who would like to take the AP English exam? And we all raised our hands. She said, great. You've got to come to school an hour early so we can start studying for this thing. And of course, that thinned out the crowd. And then by the time we took the exam, there were five of us taking it, and three of us passed. And then fast forward a few months in my first week at the University of Michigan, meeting all of my classmates and the people that I shared the hall with and my roommates, I met a young man who was from New Jersey. And he explained to me that his entire senior year, all he took were AP courses. So at Jefferson, we didn't even offer AP English, right? But we had a very motivated, intrepid teacher who got us to take the exam. And then you've got someone from this other school in New Jersey where every single course he took his senior year was an AP exam. And so my thought was, one, he's a very nice guy. He was a great guy. But he wasn't smarter than the guys and women that I went to school with at Jefferson. He wasn't smarter than them. But I thought and realized how were my classmates, and I even, supposed to compete with him, where it doesn't really matter how smart we are, or how motivated we are, what our work ethic is. He just had more opportunity than we did. And so that really clarified to me that there's, there is a discrepancy in, in the offerings of public schools. Then when I came back home after that, I really, really saw it. So I wanted to do public ed. Uh, that's why I litigated school finance. That's why I actually left city council to come to the legislature. And I realized, bless you, I realized when I was on the House floor that everybody, Republican and Democrat, both sides, they say they care about public ed. It's their number one issue. Go to their website, look at their campaign mailers. They all say it. And so I thought, if we all see it the same way, if it's something we all want, why is it that we can't seem to get anything done? And I realized that maybe it's because we don't really know what we're talking about at all. One, most legislators think that they're experts in public ed because they went to school for a long time themselves, right? The second thing is more a commentary on traditional leadership, and that is that treetops tend to spend time talking to treetops. So once you're elected, all of a sudden you're meeting the owners of things, you're pe the people who run things, you're meeting the CEOs, you're meeting other elected people. And so the problem is, what I learned was these folks do care about public ed. They do. But they're talking to superintendents, which is fine. They're talking to the other elected folks, the school board members, which is fine. But those people are in a tough spot because their job is to sort of sell those districts. Here's how great we are. Here's the number of kids we're sending to Ivy League schools. Here's how our chess team is doing in UIL, right? They, they have a hard time saying, and the bottom is falling out, and we're in crisis mode, and we need to raise the red flag. They're not good at doing that. And so I figured if I really wanted to understand what's happening on the ground, if I wanted to understand what we could do to make 
someone's life better in the classroom. I had to go and talk to the people who did it every day for a living. Make sense? I recognize at a certain point how little I knew. So this is our district. We have campuses. We have attendant zones for four, four school districts, Alamo Heights, Northside, Northeast, and SEISD, but we have campuses from three of those. The yellow is Northside, the red is Northeast, and the blue is SEISD. I would say, sure, we have a tiny, tiny smattering from Northside, about a third of Northeast, and about a half to two-thirds from SEISD. That's what you'll see there. 55 schools in general, and I made sure and visit them all. And I need to talk to you about what that was like. The first couple tours, because people didn't know what I was doing, I show up, and there's the mariachis, and the baile folklorico, and they've got coffee and juice for me, and balloons. And at a certain point, I had to say to them, I, I appreciate that. Thank you very much, but that's not why I'm here. I'm not here to tour the school. I'm not here to go into classrooms and have career day. There's a slide of me reading the kids. That's from a different visit. It's just cute. Um, but I I'm not here for that. I'm here to sit down with you and talk to you about what your life is like and what I can do to make it better. So those, those conversations were about an hour and a half to two hours long. And the first 20 or 30 minutes were, this is safe space. I'm not going to reveal our conversation at all. No matter what, I'll never identify you by name. I won't identify you by campus, and I won't identify you, and identify you by district. I needed them to be forthcoming. That took about a half hour to get them to open up. And I didn't have a, a series of questions that I asked. I, it wasn't research-based. I didn't go in with a checklist. I start off with very open-ended questions. Like, imagine that you're in the Texas House, and I represent every legislator, and I have the ability to make whatever changes need to happen based on your, on your comments. What do I need to know? Right? And then the next question might be something like, what are we getting right? What are we getting wrong? How can we get out of the way? What do you need? And then that's where the conversation came from. I wish I could go back and maybe do the first five or six again, because I feel bad for them now. Um, but after a while, I started to figure out, you start to see patterns and themes. And, and here's the, the reason why we're not identifying anybody. All of a sudden, you represent all school districts, right? The, the reason why we're keeping it anon anonymous is this. This is the urban core of San Antonio. And this is my district. There are another, forgetting about the Senate completely, there are another 149 house districts in the state. If I can find themes that are common between campuses and districts, which are super diverse, in my own district, it is likely that there are some common themes between house districts. So if the principal at Lanier and the principal at Churchill are saying the same thing, chances are the same, some of the same things in Harlingen, in Preston Hollow, in Odessa. Does that make sense? And, and I'm not going to get partisan much, but a little bit, just to give you the math. Democrat in Texas, there are 50 of us right now. There are about 50 of us in a house that's 150, which means that if I want to do anything, I've got to find 26 Republican friends to go along with me, right? So part of this exercise also is to tease all the politics out of it, to say, I don't want, I don't, we're not having a blue conversation or a red conversation. I'm just looking for common themes so that after I find them, you can take it to your part of Texas and ask folks if it's true for them as well. And whatever they say is common. Whatever they say is, is the same, let that be sort of the starting point for us to do some work together. So some of this is big picture, but a lot of it is very practical and pragmatic. Cool? All right. This is long. I'm going to try to rifle through it. But we're going to do two things. The first thing, if you have any question at any time, just raise your hand and ask, right? Just do it. The second thing is, if you've seen the report, you'll see that there's sort of a, a statement of the issue, and then there's an anonymous quote from an educator that drives the point home. And what we've done is we've passed out quotes to you guys. So as the quotes come up and read it, and that will sort of add a human element to what we're talking about. Are we good? OK. So one of the things that we learned one of the overarching things that we learned is that teachers want more instructional time. And that does not mean taking a class period that's, let's say, an hour long and adding 20 minutes. What they mean is you're asking them to do so much other things aside from teach 
that when they're left after dealing with all those things, there's not as much instruction going on. The most important thing to them, the, the, the golden nugget, right, the silver bullet is instructional time. And, and to be clear, none of them said it that way. They said, they would say, the school or the district is asking me to do this. And then this year we're in this program, so now I have, I have to do this and this. And yes, they give me a planning period, but that planning period is getting eaten up by X, Y, and Z. If you, if you pull back and you distill what they're saying, they're saying streamline my life so that I have more time to spend actually working with students. And that, that's going to, we'll, we'll talk about it, that's going to take two forms. One is an administrative form, and one has to do with social services. So there's a quote. Who's got quote one? You do. All right, I'm going to give you the mic. Okay, quote one. I bet you think I need more money, and I do, but that's not the on the top of my list. You think I need more technology, and trust me, an iPad for every student will be great. That's not what I need. You know what I need? I need time. I need more time to spend on actual instruction, and I'll show you a school that's been turned around. You know what I would do? I have a, my office take as much as possible on the teacher's paperwork. Anything that will lighten the, the load, I will do it. You know why? Teachers need to teach. Simple. So that, that educator said, look, it was a, a principal. He said, I will have my office assume as much responsibility for paperwork as I possibly can so that I leave my instructors with more time to teach. And then he said, I'm not even sure it's all legal. I'm not even sure I can do that. But I'm going to do that because that's what works. He had previously turned around other campuses and that worked. So let's go to the next what often, happens, what often happens is that if a school doesn't perform well, the district and the state swoop in and add all kinds of interventions and other programs, and in their effort to be helpful, they often add more requirements, more data collection, more uh, data input. And you guys got to put it in. Sorry. But you've got more to do that's still not instruction. Who's got two? You guys, the Texas legislature, give us so much time to do, but don't tell us how or when. You want fire drills for school buses, good idea. Now tell me how to do it and when. when what am I going to have to cut? We always have to ask ourselves these questions. These days, if I can get my teachers to spend three and a half hours on instruction a day, it's a win. Thanks. All right, and here's the other side. Remember I said one side of it was going to be administrative paperwork, um, which is a real thing, and then the other side is social services. Here is, here is the standard that we've asked Texas students to meet, every Texas student. They're not all starting in the same place. They're just not. Um, but that doesn't mean they're less talented. It doesn't mean they're less, less gifted. It doesn't mean they're less motivated. It just means that their lives are different. And so... If you're a teacher, let's say that we're all a class and you're the teacher, and in this instance, you haven't had breakfast, you don't have a winter coat, your utilities just got turned off, one of your brothers and sisters just got locked up, you've got someone away in Afghanistan, all this is coming into the classroom, and you're asked not only to deal with it and manage it, but you're also being required by us to have these students meet a certain standard. So what we're saying is, support staff, social workers, counselors, trauma counselors, and so forth, those things, communities and schools, those things pay off. And once you deal with the student as a human being, you're left with a student who is ready to learn in the classroom and a teacher who has the time to do it. Who's got quote three? You do. All right. If, if you give me money, I'm not going to spend it on stuff. I'm going to spend it on people. Just generally, one of the things that we'd like to do um, is to identify funding streams that are allocated for things that aren't personnel and see if we can loosen the screws so that educators can spend it on personnel because 
every single person said, I love all this stuff, but if you let me, if you let me hire another teacher or recruit a better teacher or bring in a social worker or two trauma counselors, that's a better use of the money. All right. That sort of speaks for itself, right? I want to be clear. Ask yourself how, if you were a legislator, you would define legally a good teacher or the best teacher. That's hard, right? What does that even sound like? Next one, please. But this sort of sheds light on it. One thing that we discovered is that in schools, especially in working class, poor, minority areas, um, in schools that have not performed well on their standardized exams, when you go to those schools, you find a very, very high concentration of new teachers. And so you would think instinctively that the places with the most need should get the best help. And in turn, what we find is that the places with the most need have a very high concentration of inexperience. Nothing's wrong with these folks. They're good people. They're good teachers. Really more, they're going to be great teachers. But just to use a sports analogy for a second, if you go to the NBA and you look at the win-loss column, oftentimes the teams with the lowest winning percentage also tend to have the youngest age, the average age of their player. It just doesn't make any sense. In other words, sure, there's going to be an all-star who's a first year, but you're not playing the odds. If you're playing the odds, you're finding ways to bring the best help to the schools with the most need, and instead we're bringing folks who just don't have a lot of experience. Nothing's wrong with that, but at a certain point, you're not playing the odds. It's not smart. Quote four, who's got it? All right. And by the way, if you guys have questions, just ask. If we're talking about young teachers, Teach for America, hit or miss. First or second year alternative certification teachers, hit or miss. First or second year education program graduates, hit or miss. But if I'm in a Title I or economically disadvantaged school, don't force me to take all three. How is it fair to the kids if we compound inexperience with more inexperience? There should be a limit. And just to be clear about this, that statement is agnostic to Teach for America, alternative certification first years, and first year traditional education program grads. It's just saying, don't load me up, right? So I need to explain this one. And, and part of this process for me, again, you guys ask questions. I can do this all day. You're getting the short version today. Um, I'll admit to you guys where I was wrong about something in an embarrassing way. I thought when I heard stories about teachers leaving schools like SAISD to, let's say, go to Northside, that they were leaving because they didn't want to deal with these poor kids, these minority kids. They didn't want to deal with these you know, older buildings. They just wanted to go somewhere where it's cushier and nicer, and the kids were sort of more prepared, and the parents were involved, and it was more of an autopilot situation. And that is completely false. Remember that whole thing about time and administration? What we heard more and more is that teachers who defected from some of these districts to other districts did so because they were being asked to do so much more than just teach. And look, teachers don't become teachers for the money. They don't. It's a calling. It's an identity. They're missionaries. And so they want to teach. They want to be teachers. They don't want to be glorified administrators who happen to teach some of the time, right? And in all fairness, they didn't, they didn't enter the profession to be social workers either, right? They're instructors. And so what's happening is they're spending less time teaching and more time doing other things. If they leave some district and go to, to the others, it's really an often, more often because they want to teach because they are teachers. So I'm admitting to you guys that I had a preconceived notion that was destroyed after the 20th visit. Let me just explain what this means quickly and we'll move on. Professional development means it has to mean something, it has to count, you have to be a better educator after the fact, and it has to be presented and offered in a way where it's not asking you to choose between your family life, the little free time you've got, and being a teacher. It has to be done, like, make it count, do it the right way, fund it, make sure you're compensated for your time, and keep going, right? Yeah, ask, yeah.
So we got three, the question was, did I get recommendations how to solve this sort of inexperienced problem? And we got three with varying levels of, of uh, sort of a mandate from the state. One is that, that any school that is an IR school, an improvement required school, that there's, only, there's a certain limit of first and second year's teachers that they can have, and after that you can't give it, you can't add any more. That's one. The other is that we only hire teachers that whose education program has had them in a classroom for an entire year before they're with another teacher before they're given classrooms of their own, right? Um, and another another would be one where the the inexperienced teachers, even if they are hired on, are only hired on as co-teachers, uh, as opposed to getting a classroom on their own. Let's talk about culture for a second. Uh, some districts have a habit, or in the past have had a habit, of moving principals around all the time, right? And so, imagine how you feel when an elected person is only in office for a few years and they jump ship to go to another district, right? So, if you're the new principal somewhere, and these are your teachers, and you come in with a new plan to change everything, or we're going to institute a, a, a new culture here, a new culture of excellence and aspiration, and the veteran teachers are like, yeah, dude, sure. I've been here for 10 years. The last few principals have been here for two. We're the constant. You're the revolving door. Let's see how this goes. They're waiting them out, right? Or, or they just don't, they're not allowed to connect with them emotionally because they don't believe they're going to stay. So the longer that you have real permanent leadership, that can stay and work with people and create a culture of excellence together, it's more likely to happen. In other words, it's just more buy-in. All right, this one is actually pretty cool. So there are dual language campuses, and dual language is a very specific thing. There are dual language campuses all over the city, all over the district. If you go to one of those campuses and you talk to people who work there, they're like, they're converts. They believe that it is the most, it is the most effective way, not only to educate students, but also to bring all students up. And that for whatever reason, and I'm not an expert, for whatever reason, those situations have academic benefits beyond just language, right? So well, the, the quote will explain it. Who's got quote five? Okay. Quote five is good. If everyone is helping each other, the English gets better, the Spanish gets better, even the math gets better. I really believe these kids will see and interact with the world differently. They'll probably save us all. Right. So I'm talking to, I'm talking to principals and teachers about language, and all of a sudden they're telling me how everybody's algebra scores are going up. There's a secret sauce in this particular model that everyone agrees with. And so it was a universal theme, so it made it in here. This is this is a basic. Who's got quote six? Okay, this is a this is a basic school finance thing. In other words, if we're saying educate these kids, get them to the standard, and they've got certain requirements that they need academically, give them the resources to get there. I mean that was a that was everywhere. I'm Imelda Obledo, retired sanitary independent school teacher. Quote six: These students are capable. They can do the work. It's just their English that's the challenge. In every other way, they're on top of their game, just as gifted, and it feels like we're punishing them. We're failing them, really. Yes, ma'am. I think that that it's a good question, and I don't have the best answer for you. I don't have the magic answer, but I will tell you that there's two things that I think are happening here. One is that as quiet as it's kept, education happens to be the top, if not one of the top three issues for most people. 
It really is. And yet, at the same time, there's a resignation that we can't do anything about it, right? And so no one's really talking about it. No one's really trying to talk about it. I mean, I, and I'll, look, you guys are nonpartisan, I'm not. But let's talk about the election for a minute. Let's just assume that there have been three major candidates, right? Trump, Clinton, Bernie. Who's talked about this issue of the three of them? Not really. Bernie, Bernie, Bernie and talking about education? Ber, Ber, like, and I'm, it's not a hit on Bernie. I'm just saying that Bernie's, Bernie's discussion of education starts with people who have already finished college. It's, it's debt, right? And so my, my point is that there's, there's a resignation. And look, by the way, that's leaps and bounds what the other two are doing. So, right? I'm just saying that, I'm just saying that people have sort of given up on the issue generally. We're happy to fight small battles, but what's interesting is that that's where the disconnect between politics and people are is because when you talk to people, that's what they care about. When I was running for city council, street sidewalks, graffiti, stray dogs. Hi, I'm Diego. How are you? Nice to meet you. I'm running to be your city councilman. What's your biggest issue? Education. I got it all the time. And I had to say, that's not really our purview, but that, they, didn't, they didn't care about that. You asked the question, that was their answer. right? And just, and just to be clear, the city council district is about 70% of the Texas House district. Right? There's just a resignation. So I think that if we start demanding it, and also in this country, education is also, I don't mean to lecture you guys, but education is also one of those things where the inequality is the most obvious. It is the most, you'll notice there's no stats here because we know that you can see it with the naked eye, right? My Jefferson AP story alone sort of clarifies that. All right, let's go. This is what they said. What the educator said was, look, if you want to give me a certified teacher a grade, are they better than the other teachers? I'm not so sure. But when it comes to language and it comes to special education, those certifications seem to matter most. In other words, if I'm trying to predict, if I'm trying to predict who's going to have the most success, you can't know for sure. But what they said, and I'm just reporting what they said, what they said was, in those two instances, you have a higher likelihood of success. And so... We, yes. Right. No, you're right, and I was I was clumsy about that. But the the special populations of students were, were, well, that's that's sort of what we mean is, is you know ELL English language learners, special ed kids. We have a whole we have a whole section here about homeless kids, which I didn't know about. So we do mean to subdivide them that way. Yeah, you're you're right. Okay. So as more and more, let's call them general ed teachers, find themselves with special ed students and other students in their classrooms. They're telling me, I, I love having them. They're great kids, but I don't feel prepared to have them in the classroom. I don't feel like I got good training. Someone didn't sit down with me and tell me, here's a trigger, here's a warning sign, here's how to deal with it. Here's the kind of professional development I, that you need. Here's who on campus you should call in case you have an issue. They're not getting it. And so you've got this really unfortunate situation of well-intentioned teachers who are not prepared. It's not that they don't care. It's not that they don't, they're not trying. It's just that we haven't given them what they need. All right. Okay. So another sort of moment of Diego didn't know what he's talking about at the beginning of this. In my mind, a homeless student was a student who was sort of living in a van or a car right, or under a bridge. Let's remember that San Antonio is essentially, it's a very sort of working class, poor city. We are the most economically segregated city in the entire country, at least major city. If my mom and I get evicted, but we're staying with my aunt, we're homeless. If we're in a house that doesn't have running water or electricity, what's the difference, right? 
the way that the federal government defines homelessness is is much more, I think, accurate than what we have in our mind. And yet, at a district and state level, we're not allocating the resources necessary to help educate and bring up this very special population. And by the way, you may be thinking, like I did, that this population is 1%, 2%, 3% of the student population. We're wrong. There's, I mean, they're scratching the double digits in that definition. And so, and so I just didn't know this, but as we talked to the educators, they said, we, you've got to help us with this. You've got to help us with these students because they're challenging. They need lots of help. But just like every other student, they're just as bright, just as smart, ready to go. Um, but we're not, we're not really serving them properly. So we included that because it, it was important and it was universal. Yes? You're right, and and part of this exercise for me is to do that is to do that for them. So, the comment was, I hear you. The comment was because they're they're trying to capture it. Uh, the the comment was that just I'll give the Cliff Notes version. Uh, the the comment was that even when we try to count these students, we're not doing it the right way. We don't have the right folks doing the count, and then that count doesn't make its way to legislators. So we know that there's something that we need to fix and do something with. Um, right. So legislators not having a clue is a theme that we should all just assume is universal throughout the issues. Right. Um, I think it's important to start. I will say, and I, I want to be clear about this. I am not saying that districts are not trying. That's not what I'm saying. When you meet the people at each district who are responsible for dealing with and interacting and servicing these kids, these are saints they are superheroes but then when you have the question the, the conversation with them about how much support they get that's where and how many how much resources they get that's where it really becomes clear oh um do you want to sure okay thanks all right testing again that's from another visit which is a good it's just a good picture um, I think that's pretty obvious, right? Uh, my own philosophy is that testing should be a diagnostic. We should do it during the year to figure out where someone is and then use that information to guide the rest of the year so we're filling in gaps and getting the class to the same place. You know, I talked to the education commissioner and I said to him, what professional takes an exam cold? Everybody studies for exam. Everybody crams for an exam. That's just what exams are. If you create a situation where the exam is so high stakes and everything is resting on it, the w whether the kid promotes, what kind of teacher you are, what kind of principal you are, what kind of campus you have, it's a pressure cooker. And it doesn't make any sense. Um, who has seven? This one speaks for itself. How do you expect to get teachers, the superstars you want us to bring in, or even the young ones we know we'll get, to come to the toughest schools when they know that the risk of being labeled a bad or unsuccessful teacher is so much higher? Okay. Think about it. You're a teacher. You want to do good work. You want to go to a school that you know really needs you and could use you. At the same time, because of the challenges at that school, you know that turnarounds don't happen in one year. It takes time and effort. But if you know that though you're going to struggle or have struggles with those students 
and that then you'll be saddled with their scores and that might affect your career trajectory or longevity, that, that effort becomes radioactive. You stay away because in your effort to help people, you're hurting yourself. We make it hard for them. And so we have to find a way to loosen those screws so that we can have the best folks come in and just do their best and not worry about their career trajectory, right? Just let them be teachers. All right. Who's got quote eight? What are they grading? How much do you want to bet the grades line up with how much money the schools get? Why A through F? We're using the language children use. They may not know the exact meaning of needs improvement, but they all know what an F is. You want them to walk around thinking that they and their friends earned the school an F? Way to go. Thanks. So if, if this isn't clear, the legislature passed a bill last session that would start to rate campuses with letter grades. And just putting my social worker hat on for a second, we are using the language of, of, of kids, of students. They may not know, they may know that needs improvement need, means needs improvement, but they don't know where that is on the scale. Every student after kindergarten knows what an F is and what an F means, or a D or a C or an A. Um, and so then when you saddle them, when you brand them with that letter grade, who knows what it does to them psychologically? Who knows what it does to them emotionally? Who knows what it does to the way they look at their own classmates, their own teachers, and their own campus? So as I went to the schools, I heard this a lot. All right. Who's got quote nine? I don't see why a student has to fail the exam three times before we can decide if they move on. It leaves them defeated because they're in a much better place when they started the school year, but somehow that's not enough. Failing the exam over and over drives home their feelings of being different or just not as smart as the other students. So there is confusion among districts about what to do with special ed testing. There's a moment where someone can demonstrate a year or two years worth of growth, right? over the course of one academic year, and yet the district can still require them to test over and over again, and only after they've exhausted the three exam, like the three administrations of the examination, will the district call the, it's a group, the ARD group, together to decide whether that student promotes. All we're, all we're saying here is that for special ed kids and other students, that we should be focused more on their growth than whether or not they pass this exam. That's what we're focusing on. If you start, if I'm a fifth grader and I started the year reading at a second grade level, and at the end of the year I'm at a fourth grade level, whether or not I pass the star is arbitrary. And we need to make sure that districts are aware that they can have a conversation about what to do with that child. And we also need to make sure that the laws and the policies reflect that freedom. All right? Cool. All right. Remember what we were talking about time? On this side, we talked about paperwork and administ administrative stuff. This is the other half, right? We've got quote 10. Call it whatever you want. Socioeconomically disadvantaged, free and reduced lunch, Title I, at risk. These students are poor. They don't come with the same advantages middle class students come with but they do come with different problems, more challenges and more work. They're just as smart, just as bright, but you have to get through all these life issues before you can get to the learning. If you don't do that, help them with life. If you don't see that, then you can't expect them to meet the same standards as everyone else. Treat the child as a human and what you're left with and what the teacher is left with is a student who is ready to learn. And you heard me say that earlier. Thank you. You heard me say that earlier. That's what this is about. The, the campuses that have doubled down on social services have found that the economic, the economic, the academic gains that are made are noticeable, substantial, and certainly worth it. And so we're saying as it relates to time, because teachers 
want more instruction time, that this serves two purposes. You're serving the kid and you're giving teachers more time to teach. Let's keep going. All right, 11. I don't know what I'd do without her, the family specialist. I can't imagine it. Don't want to. Honestly, I need to more. Will you please make that happen? Some, some schools and districts are very good about this. Some are sort of slowly learning their lesson. Uh, but for the campuses that have them, they swear by them. Let's go to the next one. I think it fills in the gap. Okay. Um, that's pretty easy. They should all work together. So... If you have all these things happening at the same campus, they need to be locked in, talking to each other, communicating. I'll give you a good example. There's one campus where they have on-campus suspension, so if a kid gets kicked, kicked out of school, they start in school. So during that week that they're kicked out, they're getting the same work at the same time as their classmates in the class they're supposed to be in. So when they finally get back into school, back into class, they haven't missed a beat, right? It's coordinated. Let's go to the other one. All right. I can get it. <laughs> but going back to your quote, let's talk about the difference between a position that's not professionalized, that is hourly, where they can't have, where they're getting paid hourly, um, or, sorry, I'm listening. They're not allowed to work before or after school, they're not eligible for overtime, and they're at, if they do move around, it's flex time. They, they have to put in for it. Versus someone who's salaried, it's professionalized, um, but they can work before and after school, they can do home visits, they can work at night, um, and, and they have the resources they need to really interact with the students, the parents, and the community. And the way I describe it is, in the schools that don't have a professionalized position, you go somewhere, and you'll find, you'll find someone who is doing a great job and they're acting as a social worker and in that same position at another campus, they're cutting out snowflakes for the Christmas program because it's not standardized. Oh, let's go back. Okay, the best example of this is John Reagan High School in Austin. They were about to get their door shut by TEA. The principal said, hey, give me a minute. Give me, just give me a couple years to try something new. And if it, if it works, great. And if it doesn't, shut me down. And what she did was she brought in all of these social services to the school. And just to give you an example, John Reagan High School looks most like Brackenridge High School. Black and brown, high immigrant population, English language learner population, right? Uh, working class. In fact, Brack now has a nicer school, a newer school than John Reagan because of the bond. Did, I mean, all of a sudden, is it, is it Harvard? No. But they went from the fifth percentile to the 30th percentile. Their graduation rates are way around 95% and above. By one measure, they had one dropout last year. So it works. The challenge, though, is that they didn't do that with state money. The state money, city money, foundations, it took a lot. But they did it. All right. Pre-K is not a luxury anymore. It's a necessity if we want our kids to make it. That, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Does pre-K matter? Yes. If you're, getting, if you're getting a student who's been in school for a year, they know what it's like to be in a school setting, they understand lessons, they understand routines, they understand when it's time to, to be in class, to go to recess, to have lunch, and then you mix that with kids who are leaving home for the very first time, and this is, and I'm not even talking about the academics, right? I'm not talking about letters and words, and numbers and math. You have to make pre-K a universal offering if you want things to improve. Yes. There are very, very few people, I mean, most people who don't send their kids, yeah.
Sure. Sure. And that, I mean, and that happens in a variety of situations. That happens um, when kids, you know, are in one school and go to another. That happens when kids are homeschooled and go to a, a public or private school. And that happens whether someone's going from a charter to a public school or sometimes to a public to a charter. I mean, it, 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 it's different. But what's here is here because it was said, you know, about at least 46 times. So that, that's why it's there. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the the question was why is why is pre K income based? Uh, I think that because government has not just made the decision to make pre K universal for everybody. There's all these different programs and grants that sort of determine who gets in and who doesn't. Some folks can afford to send their kids to a private pre-K. Uh, the ones that are offered with government money often have income requirements. Our point, though, is that when those kids who have those different, those different experiences get to kindergarten, the differences are so great that, it, one, it's unmanageable, but two, the kindergarten teacher does not want to create a sort of bifurcated or dual classroom for the pre-K kids and the non-pre-K kids. They kind of need each other to bring each other up to par and keep going. But what they're saying is the differences are so vast, the canyon between the two is so great that pre-K and the, and the academic benefits are so great that universal pre-K is really the way to go. So the way it went was this. Talk to kinder, kin, kindergarten teacher. Hi, I'm Diego. Thanks for sitting down with me. Tell me, does pre-K matter? Yes, it does. Off they went. Right? Okay. I got a grant to buy new computers, so in the library you'll see a nice cart full of 78 brand new Chromebooks. Problem is, we can't really turn them on. Chromebooks, Chromebooks only work if they're connected to the internet. The wiring here can barely handle what we have now. Add 78 Chromebooks and it's completely tapped out. It can't handle all the devices on at once, so they just sit there, off. All right, the point of this quote the point of this quote is to sort of demonstrate another blind spot that I had. I thought that when it came to technology in public schools, it was always a hardware issue, right? Do you have enough iPads? What kind of computer do you have? What is it running? Are we still running Windows XP, right? And I, I was completely blind to this phenomenon where sometimes, not always, sometimes they actually have the hardware, they have the technology, but they don't have the infrastructure. They don't have the, the, the Wi-Fi wiring to have them all on at once. And by the way, I want to be clear. Some of you may be thinking as we read these that all these quotes are from here. They're not. Okay? This one in particular is from somewhere here. They had 78 Chromebooks. For those of you who don't know what a Chromebook is, it's like a small starter laptop that only works if it's connected to the internet. Otherwise, it is a dead device. They got 78 new ones. They're beautiful. The school is very small. Would have gone a very, very long way. They could have had two classrooms at a time using them, but there's no way they can turn them all on at once. And so they are just beautiful, lovely paperweights. Right? It was the infrastructure in the building itself that determined whether or not they could use the technology. And so that, that was shocking to me, but it's also something that I had not thought about. Yes, ma'am. Sure. The, the, the comment was, we could have given the school a grant with strings attached, and they could have used it for that or something more useful. I mean, one of the things that, that is certainly true is that we learned that the hierarchy in a school district is very complex. We also learned that most people are terrified of their superiors, and that was one of the reasons why it was hard for them to talk with us. Uh, it took a long time. But, oh, is there another question? Okay. But you're, you're right. I think that 
that one of the challenges is how much discretion do you give to a principal for a campus and how much is sort of maintained by their superiors? And then are their superiors paying attention close enough, and I'm including school board members in this, to what's happening at each campus? I'll get to that at the end, but the, the short answer is two things. One is I've teased all the politics out of this. So if my Republican colleague in Odessa goes and talks to his educators and they say, yeah, this is true for us too, if the educators in Odessa and the educators in San Antonio are saying the same thing, it starts to become a mandate because there's no, there's nothing in it. The other thing is that yes, it costs money, but what we're also trying to do is to say, we're not saying throw money at the problem. It's a great phrase they use all the time. Throw money at the problem. You can't throw money at the problem. Okay. Well, I've given you some very discreet, pragmatic ways to spend money, right? So instead of you feeling like you're just giving money, you're throwing money to this black abyss, you can actually use it in very strategic ways, in ways that educators have told you will make a difference. But the third thing, I guess, is that I'm not sure that we're using all the money we have in the most strategic way. And I'll get to that. I'm not saying that that's instead of, but let's remember, we got a Supreme Court decision that said the way that we fund school finance is okay. And then this week, we found out that Texas is working with a billion dollars less. There's not gonna be a lot of excitement to spend more on anything. So I'm looking at, I'm, I'm trying to be nonpartisan. I'm trying to say, if you want to spend more money, and we should spend it in these ways, and even if you're not gonna spend more money, let's figure out how to make sure the money we do have is spent in a way that makes the most sense or makes the biggest difference. And we'll, and we'll get to that. All right. I think that's pretty straightforward, right? People need to know what they're doing. You don't want someone figuring out what an iPad is or a touch screen for the first time in their life when they're 10 or 11. Keep going, please. All right. This is funny because this slide, so spend money on materials that teachers need and use. And then we, we follow that up with a photograph of a bunch of kids learning how to DJ on digital turntables. Um, so ignore the picture. It's just there for comedic effect. But this goes to part of what we were talking about, and that's textbooks. I didn't know this. You know, I turned 40 this year. When I was growing up, textbook was the roadmap. It was the blueprint for the school year. That's not the case anymore. Right? It is one of many tools that educators use. Many of them may not touch a textbook for months on end. Some use them a lot. I heard math people, math teachers use them all the time. Okay, math, you're good. But other folks may not use their textbook that much at all, and yet we're spending millions and millions and millions of dollars on textbooks. And so, the, for example, the, the educational materials allotment there's a number of things you can spend that money on, but personnel, like social workers or the teacher, isn't one of them. So what does it look like, and we're, we're working ourselves through it, I'm not ready to say we're going to do it, but what, what does it look like if we loosen the screws on that law and allow them to use some of that money on personnel? Does that solve the inequalities? Not even close. But does it, does it give them some of the ability to spend money in a way that would actually make a difference? Does it move the needle? It could. And I wanna make sure, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying trade moving the needle and do that instead of fighting for school finance, I'm saying it's both. You have to do both at the same time, right? While I'm trying to solve the school finance, school equity issue at the same time, in the meantime, I'm trying to do things that make a difference in the classroom. Yes? Everything you can think of, they do. So they're using the internet, 
They're creating their own materials. They're borrowing materials from other teachers who have done it before and created their own materials. So there's, there's sort of like crowdsourcing uh, lesson plans and lesson materials. And then there are also some things that are like textbooks, but they're not. They're called uh, consumables. So they're, they're workbooks that the kids can take home and write on and then tear off and turn in. But they're a lot cheaper than the big bound textbooks. Yes? So because I'm not doing my job very well, her question was, if they're not using textbooks, what are they doing? And that's why I gave the answer about they're using everything that's out there. Your comment was the TEKS. That's what we are asking students to know. Sometimes if there's a, a subject and there are TEKS, meaning the students have to know these seven or eight things by the end of the year. It's not seven or eight, of course, but many. The corresponding textbook only gets to half of that that you actually have to supplement the textbook in order to get the kids to meet the state requirements anyway. So even though we're spending state dollars on a resource, the resource doesn't even get the students to where the state is requiring them to be in the first place. Thank you for that. Okay, who's got quote 14? Field trips make the world smaller and make more sense. If we all go somewhere, we have a common experience I can draw on all year that makes sense to everybody. We're almost done, you guys. All right, you guys can stretch a little bit. I didn't know this. I guess field trips really matter. I, who, I didn't know. I, that field trips for me were a chance to knock off and not be in class and meet girls. That's what they were for me. But one teacher said, if I could just get a field trip in to create a common experience between my students that we can draw on all year, that would make a big difference. And I said, okay, you know, you're a nice sort of liberal, hippie educator. And then just for fun, I asked that question over and over and over and over and over again. And it was a resounding yes. They absolutely matter. They mean a great deal. They help students contextualize their life. They create common experiences. They build community. Some of the students haven't gone more than a mile and a half outside of, their, uh, of the radius of their school anyway. So it, it, it matters. The other thing is, the, the other part of this is a, is a philosophy that I heard quite a bit. You know, art and extracurriculars, after schools are often the first to get cut. But there is a philosophy that I heard over and over again that for a lot of students, you need to give them one extra attachment or connection to school aside from class. And if you do that, there's a higher likelihood that they will get through and thrive. And it, doesn't, it could be art, it could be chess club, it could be football, it could be band, it could be campus cleanup. You give them one extra thing to do, one extra connection, and it helps get them through. There was one principal who said we would lay out the entire student body and make sure we knew what that extra thing was. And if there, if there was a student who didn't have an extra thing, we went, and we went to them and said, here's nine things you, wanna do, you might want to do. Which one works for you? And they, their goal was always to make sure there was that extra connection. I didn't know, but they swear by it, and the folks who do it swear that it works. Um, and I, I, I sort of found it to be a sort of beautiful yet really intuitive thing that unless you go and talk to these people at their schools, you would never know that, right? All right. Okay, we're at the end. This is the part. I included it because it, it was universal and mind-blowing and frustrating. There are lots of hungry students in our city. We have one of the best, finest, most robust food bank operations on the entire planet. 
And that is a bad thing because that is supply meeting demand. Not to take away from the leadership there. But I went to a school, and, and when I walked in, I knew the principal. We were old friends. And so it made it easier for us to talk and have a real conversation. And she explained to me that while on this side of the graph, this is from the school. This, this is a picture of what they prepared for me. On this side are all these academic issues, but on this side, over here, food insecurity is the fancy word for hunger. And you'll see next to that is 100 plus. The campus itself is barely over 700 kids. They identified 100 kids, not that were hungry, but 100 kids that were so hungry that they had to put food in their backpack from Friday to Monday. It's a program they had at that campus. So then after I was blown away by that, I'd go to all the other schools and ask the question, and I learned something even more disturbing. And that is that the depth of that program is solely dependent upon how much the people at that school either care or are keyed into the problem. So at one school, they've identified 100. You go to another school that looks like that school or maybe is an area that's even more challenged, and they've identified 10. Then you go to another school where you think the problem doesn't exist, and it absolutely does, and they've identified 80. And then you realize that you're doing it with Snack Pack for Kids, you're doing it with the food bank, you're doing it with Walmart, you're doing it with HEB, and there's no uniformity whatsoever at all. It's, it was and is infuriating to me. So we have to acknowledge that there is a hunger problem in our city. I can't speak to other jurisdictions, but we actually have a proposal to work on this. Let's go to the next one. Who's got quote 15? All right. Not easy to read. I'm sorry, I have a knot in my throat. I can get through it. <laughs> I didn't always know what to do with the hungry students who came to see me. Later in the day, because we're not allowed to give them cafeteria food after the lunch period, there was one young man who came to see me more than a few times a week. So with him, I took, I took to us walking back and forth between the main campus and one of the po uh, portables in the back. There was a pecan tree there. So we'd walk back and forth and stop so he could pick and eat a few until he felt better. So, the one time where I struggled to keep it together on these visits was when the counselor told me that story. I want to be very, very, very clear with you guys. That story is not from down here. It's, it's from up here. Right? So the USDA has a supper program where they can offer meals after school. One of the things that is not a legislative thing but a community thing is that we can advocate that as many schools engage in that program as possible. It doesn't cost them anything. If you're a school that doesn't do it and then you decide to do it, you're in the black because all the resources are there to pay for it. That's one thing. Can we go to the next slide, please? So, so we act, I, the end of this section is me telling you exactly what our legislation that would do that, how it works. 
But before that, I'm going to rail on the adults who have allowed this to exist for a very long time. And who should... No, no, no. I got it. Who's got 16? There's a little girl, about seven, who walks herself four blocks to school every Monday. She comes early and waits right outside the door, waiting for it to open so she can run into the cafeteria and get breakfast. We know she doesn't get much food or good food on the weekends. We can tell. Thanks. And just going back, going back to that time is the most important thing that an educator has. Imagine what it's like when you've got students coming to class on Monday who haven't had good food over the weekend. What that's like for you, what it's like for the, the other kids, and what it's like for that kid. Let's go to the next one. All right. To your question. To your question, which is super intuitive. It is unconscionable. It is a tragedy, and it is a failure of leadership that we have not solved this problem yet, or tried to. I had a district tell me that one reason why they don't stockpile food to give to their hungry kids is because they have a rodent problem, district-wide. I'm not a violent person, but I wanted to punch somebody. Here's our solution to this, and remember, Young, in terms of legislative years, Democrat, right? What, what can we do to solve this? Here's our first solution. We have a bill that has three prongs. It starts with an acknowledgement of the Good Samaritan Act, which is a federal law that allows nonprofits to come to schools and collect leftover food. The way it works now, in a lot, especially in Texas, is that a nonprofit can come to your school, collect the food, and then they, they take it back to wherever they're at. Let's say it's the food bank. They take it back to the food bank, and then they redistribute it. But it doesn't make sense if this is all a school, and this side of the room is all hungry kids who are getting the Friday to Monday backpack stuffing program, whoever it is. And this is the cafeteria that while we're doing this, we're throwing away hundreds if not thousands of pounds of food every week, right? So our bill works like this. Good Samaritan Act. Prong one, there's three prongs. Prong one is you allow a district employee, a teacher, a, a counselor, a custodian, to be a designee of a nonprofit. And they don't have to be food-based nonprofits, by the way. So if there's a moment where they can put on their food bank or Boy Scout, whatever it might be, right? Green Lantern fan club, they can put on their nonprofit hat. That's prong one. Prong two is that the school, you can use the school to house, keep, and store the food. It's what's called a permissive bill, which means we're not making them doing it. We're, we're giving them permission to do it. We're clearing the path for them to do it. So we're not telling them which food they have to keep. One school can spend $500,000 and get coolers to, to keep every single thing. Of course, it all has to comply with federal, state, and local health codes. But another school doesn't have that capacity can say, look, we're just going to start with the bottled water and apples and oranges. Fine. Do something. So prong two is that you can use the school to store house and keep the food. And the third part, the third prong, is you can also use the school as a staging area to redistribute that food. It does not have to leave campus. It can stay on campus and go back into the hands of the kids who need it. Is it designed to take the place or, or eliminate the programs? No. But it could, or it could supplement them, or it could grow the number of kids you're giving food to, or, if we're being honest, some of these programs, some of these backpack stuffing programs, if you look at the food that's in those packs, it's a diabetes starter kit. So I agree that some food is better than no food, but you're then hurting them in another way. There's one that's it's chocolate milk and gummy bears and uh, Slim Jim, uh, Pop-Tart. I'm not making this up. It's on the, it's on the Internet. You know, so throw an apple in there with our law. I mean, do something. But that's, that is our own legislative answer. Look, there are some bills we think we can carry like this one. 
because they're slam dunks and there are other bills to address these issues that we know and hope our Republican colleagues will pick up and run with because if we do it on our own, it doesn't have the same shot. Yes? There can be contracts. Her, her question was, or her comment was, her understanding was that there was a, the contract between the, the school and the supplier that prevents them from redistributing the food. And there's also a sort of federal, there's a federal element having to do with the way that the federal government recognizes what a meal is. But there's nothing that prevents, if I, if I give you a tray and it's got, let's say, lasagna, an apple, an orange, a slice of bread, some milk, and a bottled water, and you only eat the lasagna and the milk. There's nothing that prevents the school, well, there's nothing that should prevent the school, and now that it prevents the school from taking that leftover food and engaging in the Good Samaritan Act to allow a food bank to collect it, because they're not losing out on any money. They're not, it's not interfering with the sort of the meal counting, right, because the meal was served. After the meal was served, right, don't ask, don't tell. Um, but, but our point is that that leftover meal, it could travel 25 miles to the south to someone else, or it could go 25 feet to a kid at the same school who could use it. Yes? And these children are coming to our after-school program and are getting fed and are using our computers and are able to engage with all that they do not have at home. We're there until 6 o'clock in the afternoon. It's a free program. That food that he's talking about also gets to these kids. Uh, Food bank donates to us. We give out food all the time. But there's more to that than just the food. These children are coming and asking for a mentor. They're asking for help. They're asking for psychological help. They're asking for just about anything they need. And they're not afraid to ask, trust me. I, uh, I handle one department that I focused in on earlier that you mentioned maximizing the opportunities which was a header for most of your stuff. Am I right? Maximizing the opportunities is exactly what you all need to do, every school district. I didn't know this. I'm from Corpus Christi, so I'm an implant. Uh, 117 schools are just in the north side independent school district. 117. Like you, I visit all of them. I handle interpreting translation services. There's more than just a bilingual culture in San Antonio. It's a hotbed for languages. We found out early on that the teachers, the school districts needed to help with these children, not only to explain to them what they were going to learn or what they were needing to learn, but to explain to their parents who do not speak English of what they needed, whether it was a vaccine, whether it was paperwork, whether, whatever. We are now in about every school district, including Judson, Schertz, Zablo, Alamo Heights, and above and beyond every school district that you represent here. We are in every school with a contract, with the school district, helping out each child that can speak a different language that does not speak English very well. We do have ESL classes, English as a second language, and they're free. Imagine that. There are other charities. Please don't look at this as just Catholic charities. There are other charities out there 
that have similar, similar programs, and they are willing to help. If you find a charity within your school district that would like to help, all you have to do is ask. We go knocking on every door, and because we represent one particular charity, sometimes we're accepted, sometimes we're not. We don't have a problem with that. There's a lot of different charities out there that are willing to help, willing to jump in. We have a foster grandparent program. We stipend the foster grandparent program. We pay them to go to your classes and help you out. They're, not, they're retired teachers. They're not even teachers some, in some cases, but they're just there to help out in case you need them. Please use your resources. Great. I'm going to use your comments to sort of highlight a frustration I have. Do you guys know how many school districts there are in the city? Just the city. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. 15, 16. Right? And then you've got all the campuses in each district creating contractual relationships with a potpourri, right? a smattering of nonprofits for a variety of different things. At a certain point, there has to be some level of standardization of services. Maybe not of who provides the service, but that the, the services are there. Th this sort of one-off model almost guarantees that the students th who are at the schools and in district with the least resources get the least help. There has to be something standardized here. So I think I hit these three. I think we talked about it, right? Get the report into the hands of other legislators, have them talk to their own educators, because nothing in here is my opinion. There's nothing here where you're getting, the only thing that, that you'll get from me is the Supreme Court ruling was absurd. I think it's the only thing that we say. Otherwise, it's just a collection of stuff that people said. So if you don't like it, if you disagree with it, don't talk to me. I'm not the one. Go argue with those educators about their everyday experience. Good luck with that. Right? So that's why when I was talking about politics and being nonpartisan, it's it, these educators don't care that I'm a Democrat. And they don't care if someone's Republican. They, they, all they care about are these students and how well these students can do, and they all believe that they have, or innately, the ability to thrive and succeed. And so that's what I'm asking, is that you take the politics out of it. Because honestly, like you were saying, it's gotten us nowhere, right? So, so get into the hands of other, of other educators, and then, you know, let's, let's sort of see what happens. I recognize where I am on the food chain politically, um, but, but the office, and I've got great people working alongside me, those folk, we treat every issue like it's got a shot. We sort of run it until it can't. Yes? Um, I'm just saying that there is some research out there and there can probably be more research done in the state of Texas about the connection, the link between inadequacy of food and performance and the standards are so high and the pressures are so high in the state of texas but we're still underperforming and so naturally you would hope that logic would lead everybody to understand you know that connection and then the other thing too is that i, I do i do see and i've been privileged to work with a lot of these grassroots organizations that do help provide a lot of after school programs and incentives for the students and the families and the schools but the policy still is inadequate and it's not, we're not even scratching the surface of the needs from what you've shown us today. Right. No, she's right. If, if my only goal, if my sole goal as a legislator was to continue to beat the drum on school finance and that's all I did, that is a worthy thing to do. That is a worthwhile use of my time and it has to be done. But I actually have more capacity than that. I can do that and this. I try, in the meantime, try to find ways, one, to improve classrooms in a strategic way, but also we can use this to guide our school finance conversations because what most of the legislators hear when we talk about school finance is just more money. 
But we're not talking about how that money is going to be used. We're not talking about what that money is going to buy. We're not talking about the way that, that money translates into more resources and better performance for our students. It can be both. Um, I, I'm perfectly comfortable with using this as a roadmap to shepherd our conversation on school finance. Um, but it's tough. Yes? So the question was, what can communities do to provide more services, to get more services, to improve the schools? I'll give you my own opinion. It's not in here. Um, so report time is over. Diego time starts. Um, one is that public education is absolutely the responsibility of every level of government. This idea that, oh, I'm a city council person, so I can't talk about it, or oh, I'm a county commissioner, I can't talk about it, or I'm a congressperson, and so all I can do is talk about moving mountains of money around, but I can't get to the campus level, is false. Right? That absolves us of responsibility. And maybe one of the reasons why we can't get any movement is because even the, even the people who are well-meaning are, are kicking the can. I visit every school as a city councilman for a different reason. Right? I said, hey, I'm a city councilman, I want to help. Love to meet with your PTA. Maybe there's, maybe there's a way that we can help out with programming or or connecting you with nonprofits. It was it was different, but I recognized that it's important. I think you saw our last mayor Julian do the same thing. Um, but my point is that I believe that public education is the responsibility of every level of government, and if they all work together on it, then there's all these opportunities to bring the community in to help out. One of the great remember when I was talking about the professionalized salaried kind of social worker type employee, their job is not academic. They don't do tutoring, right? They don't do after school uh, academic mentorship. They're, they're to help with, with someone not having clothes, someone not having food, dealing with utilities. And in doing so, they are working in tandem with the school and the principal and the teachers and the parents to create a team around the kids. And I will tell you, at these schools where they have very, very good folks who do that, you also find a very, very active and demanding PTA, right? And trust me, you, you th think you've seen an angry neighborhood association? Wait till you go to PTA, a PTA meeting. <laughs> neighborhood association says we want more sidewalks, okay. You get 60 parents saying we need more sidewalks, right? Or what are we going to do about this leftover food or... We have one family specialist, we need more. Or how is it right that we don't have a school nurse? When those folks organize, it's, it's powerful. But those, those wraparound services bleed out of the school and into the community. So I, I think that there's a, there's a benefit, like a social political benefit. My, I mean, lowercase p, political. A, a political benefit to having those folks because they, they bleed out of the school and into the community. Yes, ma'am. I want to thank you for what you've done because I've been barking. I feel like I've been barking at the wrong tree for many years. Like I've been, I've gone to Austin. I've gone to the school board, uh, the principals, like our bilingual students have different, even different needs. And I'm wondering if you, I'm the one that put, can you put this in Spanish please? Can you put this in Spanish on your Facebook? And I'm here to also offer you my two languages. Uh, because I really think parents need to be involved. And some parents do get put off if it doesn't say Spanish will be spoken. And I have three kids back there. And if you can provide childcare for some, you know, I don't know how far, um, how, you know, I don't know what your vision is, but I hope it's like a long-term vision. And if that's, that's the case, then you need to think of parents, bilingual parents or monolingual parents and parents with children. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I will tell you that you're right. Um, we're, we're sort of learning as we go. And in all honesty, and folks who know me can say this, my wife is here, she can tell you, I'm kind of a blunt instrument. 
Um, so I sort of have an idea of what I want to do, and I go after it, and then people are saying, hey, you sort of forgot this, or you should include that, or have you considered X, Y, and Z? And so as we move forward, we will. Um, let me get him, and I'll get you. So I appreciate that. So what, what he said was we should add that every San Antonian, every resident should walk into their neighborhood school and see what's going on and ask questions. Um, you'll notice that I, I think there's a longer sort of school board conversation that we can have at a different time, right? Um, there's a longer school board conversation to have, um, I think that I'm. I'm. I, it was a privilege to walk into these schools and visit with people. Um, I did hear a lot that I was the first one to do that in a long time at any level, uh, and that's sort of shocking to me. But that sort of goes to a previous point I made, which is education tends to be one of the top three things that people really, really care about, and there's also a resignation that we can't do anything about it. And even at a minimum, we're not even holding the people who make the promises to us accountable for giving it their best shot, right? And that bothers me. Um, there was another hand up. Uh, with, just to answer your question, that's why we're here. I mean, we volunteered our services. We have a language scenario we have over 140 languages that we can reach out to and we try to help out as much as we can we're advocates for education bottom line so we want to make sure everybody knows you made the comment on facebook and then we had translators here just in case yeah sorry sorry yes and schools of San Antonio handles a lot of those issues. They handle the basic needs for the child. They handle the social emotional needs, that, which gives teachers more time. And we're a solution that falls outside the school finance funding formula. We're actually a legislative um, line item in TEA's budget. Yet in the LAR that TEA just published, they're recommending a 15% cut to programs like, or well, specifically to communities and schools, which provides those crucial wraparound services for our students. So I'm saying there is maybe not the whole solution, but part of the solution that we can impact it without changing the school finance formula. And we need to talk with our TEA commissioner and our um, speaker Strauss and Lieutenant Governor Patrick, because those are the individuals that can influence the budget and get the resources back into the budget to help our teachers do the very tough job that they have to do. All right, great. I've kept you guys here a long time. Some of us hadn't had their tacos yet. Um, are there any other questions? I'm happy to take them. I'll hang out for a little bit afterwards. But look, you guys, I have learned through this that education is something that people care about, but it's very hard to get people t together to talk about it. Um, and I think part of that is because there's a resignation that we can't change anything. I'd like to, I'd like to change that narrative. Yes.
day and they're hungry or, they're, you know, they want to milk or whatever. Well, we get the email, the threatening email um, stating everything needs to be thrown away right after breakfast. Um, administration disciplinary action will be taken if we walk in a walkthrough and we see food out. How do you deal with that with the Good Samaritan Act? It's a good question. And I don't know, and I don't want you to say right now what school or district you're from, but I will say that very often district policy does not line up and is more restrictive than what the law actually allows. A lot of folks are so petrified of upsetting their superiors or the lawyers who are just looking at the world as a world of liability that they err on the side of caution and they're so cautious that they start to do things not only that don't make sense, but that sort of fly in the face of human decency. And I suspect that's what you're dealing with more than a law. Okay, you guys? Yes. I'm not sure this is true, but I've heard that there's a strong, <clears throat> I've heard that there's a strong um, daycare lobby that it really is opposed to public financing of pre-K and, and those kind of things. So we talk about some school administrators. My general question is, how do we identify the opposition? Because that's kept very quiet. Sure. So, so I'll admit to you that I've never come across the, the dark forces of the daycare lobby just yet, um, but I have encountered the textbook lobby, um, which is like the one the capital P political body that all the educators were aware of, the textbook lobby. They knew about them and knew that a lot of the reason, they, they believe a lot of the reason why we have so many textbooks and spend so much money on them that we're not using is because of the lobby. Um, and, then, and then the other, the other very strong lobby in public ed tends to be the ones that coincide with policy perspectives that elected folks like Dan Patrick have. So the charter school lobby is very strong. The public, the private school lobby is very strong. Uh, the home school lobby is very strong. And the, the, the public school lobby looks a lot like, like public school employees. They're sort of like this ragtag group of folks, but they're, they're good. Um, but I, I don't, it's, to me it's not who are the other players, it's, it's really, where do they get the information that what they're, because what they're saying is, well, we believe, we believe this will work more than this works, right? And so they'll say things like, you can't throw money at the problem. We always hear that, right? And I always respond to them with, when have we ever tried to do that? Tell me the moment where we actually funded education the way that we, we think that we should and we saw how it went. It, we've never done it. It's never happened. So um, I, I believe there's more at work. I will say this, if there is a dollar to be made, Right? Whether it's some of the charter schools, some of the textbook folks, some of the public schools. Right? Some, some of the reasons why they are the way they are with food is because there's money attached to food. Right? And if you make sure you throw all the food away, then you get reimbursed for that entire meal. So whenever there's a buck to be made, you'll find powerful, strong forces. Yes? You want the mic? Okay. I, uh, I have a teacher voice. You got a handsome look there, guy. <laughs> watch that show and think, man, if only a superintendent or a school board would, would kind of go undercover into the schools. And, um, you know, the reason that it's important, I think, what you did, and I hope, I don't know if you're trying to twist the arms of your fellow legislators to get them to do, to do the same thing, but uh, it's, I, I often run into the macro-micro issue. So when I'm talking to somebody about, well, this is what I see as a teacher, a lot of times they, they tend to dismiss that. And it's not just legislators. Sometimes it's superintendents as well as, well, you don't really get the macro picture. You're more at the micro level. And I think what you're trying to do here is talk about how they fit together and um, that, that you can't really do the, mic the macro without understanding the micro. Thank you. You said that better than I ever could. You're hired. Um, he's right. Right? Want to talk about school finance? Want to talk about things that we can do in the classroom to make it better? Maybe 
this can guide our conversations about this and take the politics out of it. I think that's exactly right. Other questions before we wrap up? Okay, you guys, we appreciate it very much. Um, if there are any groups that you're part of that want this presentation privately, we're happy to do it. Um, we've, we've gotten some requests from PTAs. I actually gave it to an entire group of teachers from a particular campus that wanted it because they knew I had visited their campus. I'm happy to do that. Um, but more than anything, this is a work in progress. We learn things all the time, and as we learn things, we may have to change and adjust what's in here because it be, it, so we hit that critical moment where it's so ubiquitous that it makes its way in. So um, don't be surprised if there's like a, a version two or a version three later on. But I, I really appreciate you guys coming out on a Saturday. It means a great deal to me. And um, let's just sort of keep the conversation going. All right? Thank you very much.